you're probably wondering what I'm doing with the basketball. I'm going to tell you in a minute. <laughs> All right. Um, we are taking a journey with Jesus through the last week of Jesus' life. Uh, today we deal with the prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For all that I misspeak or don't speak, O oh God, correct it and add it in our hearing, that we may hear today your word of truth, the word that you would have for us, the word that you would have for each of us individually. May we, may we hear your voice through these work, words from the Gospel of Mark. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as some of you know, I love sports. And particularly, I love college basketball. And here in a couple of weeks, March Madness starts. Anybody know anything about March Madness? Okay. When March Madness starts, don't try to call me. Uh, because I'm going to... Well, no, you can call me. It's right. um, I'm going to be sitting in front of the TV watching basketball games. Now, one of my favorite parts of a basketball game is when one team gets behind, particularly toward the end of the game, the other team, the team that's behind, will do what's called a full-court press, okay? And in a full-court press, they guard the other team the entire court, trying to double-team the, the players and steal the ball to, in order to catch up. Now... Typically, teams don't um, use the full court press because it takes a lot of energy. It wears down the players. And second, it, the team, if it breaks the full court press, they may have a chance at a real easy basket because of the, uh, the effort on the, the other side, on the other end of the court. So, um, full court press. As we look at Gethsemane, she played basketball in high school, could you tell? Um, as we go to Gethsemane, the full court press has begun. We know, we know that the time is counting down. We know that Jesus will be betrayed, arrested, denied, legally tri un illegally tried. His closest followers will scatter, and we will see him crucified. It is a full court press that is in effect the last week of Jesus' life. It does not look good for the home team. And as the full court press begins, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. His, um, he has just ha celebrated the Passover meal, his last meal with his disciples. And from there, he says, I want to pray. And so they go from the upper room that's in Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. Now, those of you who have been to the Holy Land or know anything about the geography there, Jerusalem is up on a hill. That's what made it... Uh, difficult to defeat as armies would try to attack it. And on the side where most armies would attack, there is the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives goes down into what's called the Kidron Valley, and then there is a fairly sharp upward uh, 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 rise to the geography there to the walls of Jerusalem. Almost impossible, almost impossible to scale the walls if you're coming out of the Kidron Valley. Well, <clears throat> there are ways into Jerusalem from the Kidron Valley. And probably more than likely what the disciples did, there's a set of stairs that come down out of the walls of Jerusalem, down into the valley. And then you would step across the, the, uh, the brook, really, that's there. And then make your way up to the Mount of Olives. And about three quarters of the way up, you have the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where Jesus goes to pray. 
I want you to imagine for a moment the trip that those disciples took. At the Passover meal, typically 250,000 lambs were slain for the meal. Their blood, as a part of the sacrifice, would be poured into the Kidron Valley, into the brook that would flow down into an area where a lot of the sacrificial blood would flow. On the night in which Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he had to step across the brook that ran through the Kidron Valley. I can imagine with the full moon shining down because Passover takes place at a full moon. Full moon is shining and the shadows are surrounding the disciples as they make their way down the Kidron Valley. And I can only imagine the the mind of Jesus as he steps across this blood red creek knowing that he was to be the sacrificial lamb, the final sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world. He knew that in a few hours, in just a few hours, he would hang upon a cross. The Spirit of God has gone into a full court press. Time is counting down. And as Jesus prays at Gethsemane, we see the agony of Jesus. We see Jesus offering himself to the will of the Father. We see the most intimate side of Jesus in his relationship with with the Father. And as we follow Jesus and, and go step by step and verse by verse through Mark's account of, of, of what happens in Gethsemane, I, I just invite you to learn and maybe to seek the prayer process that Jesus is going through as he goes to Gethsemane. But because, in the same way, I believe that God wants to hear our sorrow, distress, anxiety, and fears. I believe that God wants to hear our prayers. And so, let's get started. In Mark 14, 32, it says, And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. Find solitude. That's what Jesus has done here. Jesus would go often to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke tells us in his gospel that it was the practice of Jesus to spend prayer whenever he was in Jerusalem at the Garden of Gethsemane. In a way, Gethsemane was symbolic of the suffering that Jesus was to face. The name means oil press. <laughs> you get that? Oil press. See, the Mount of Olives, they would bring it to to the place of Gethsemane where the olives then would be crushed and made into olive oil. And, and so just, just follow me here. Jesus has gone to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, to feel the crush of the weight of the sins of the world. And the result is not defeat and death, but rather victory. Something good comes out of this press. Something good comes out of what happens at Gethsemane. Jesus does not avoid the heavy weight he carries. Instead, the pressure becomes a source of power in the prayer that he, that he prays to the Father. And, and what we know is that throughout the Gospels, anytime Jesus prays, he seeks solitude. He finds a place of solitude where he can truly commune with the Father. For Jesus and for us, in the worst of times, a prayer of pain can become a source of clarity, support, and strength if we can but hear what God has for us in solitude. Mark continues, He took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be distressed and agitated. Here, Jesus is pouring out sorrow. And so should we. We should pour out our sorrow. It's, to me, it's disturbing that we hear that Jesus was distressed and agitated. 
the Lord of life? The, the, the King of kings? To be distressed? How, how can this be? How can the Lord be such? But really, when we look at the translation that we find in most of our Bibles, it does not fully capture what, what, what agitated means and distressed means as we, as we hear the words from the reading of the Scripture. More fully, the Greek means amazed or deeply moved. And these Greek words are typically used when something good is about to happen. These words are used as kind of a... And where, where, where a person or a group is at the edge and they are, they're, they're, they are experiencing suffering, they're experiencing the hardship of life, but they know that on the other side of the valley there shall be relief. Jesus was agitated. He was sorrowful, but not without anticipation. Not without anticipation. And in the same way, I think that, Jesus, that God wants to hear our prayers, to hear our sorrow, to hear our distress, our anxiety and fears. So when we come to the time of prayer, let us do so knowing God can use all things to bring good and glory. And, and Mark continues, and he said to them, I am grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. Now what we see Jesus doing here is he is, he is seeking the support of others. He has brought the disciples with him, which is unusual for Jesus. Okay? And then he has taken Peter, James, and John and pulled them a little farther. This is even more unusual for Jesus. So what we're seeing in this particular prayer of Jesus is we're seeing the greatest need that Jesus has being presented to the Father. And so he takes with him, he seeks the support of others. And so in our own prayers, should it not be the case that we should seek the support of others? That's what the church is. The church is our place to share our sorrows, our concerns, our needs, to join in prayer for each other and with each other. We should never see life as, as a solitary action or our faith as a solitary experience. Instead, we are to join together to find our strength with each other. On Monday morning, I have a, or actually afternoon, it's one o'clock, I have a prayer group that meets with me and we meet by Zoom and any of you are welcome to join us. Just let me know and I'll send you the Zoom link. And, and, and what we do is we share concerns and then I share my own concerns. And I, what I've asked this group to do is to pray for me as I pray for them. And on a regular basis, I, I let them know that I depend upon their prayers. As they held up Moses' arms as the armies prevailed. So I feel like that those who join with me on Monday hold up my arms in leading this church. I, I, I don't, I've, I've always had groups that joined with me, and I don't think I could do this job without your prayers, without your support, your spiritual support through those prayers. Seek the support of others when we face the full court press of life. Mark continues. And going a little further, he threw himself on the gro ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Struggle with God openly in anticipation of God's power. Now, I've had individuals tell me that, you know, your, your prayer should be, you know, positive, that you should speak to God in, in great terms. Um, I think we need to be honest with God. If we're hurting, if we're struggling, we need to let that go in our prayer time. God, what are you doing? What is this about? Can't you see that I'm hurting? Be honest with God. Struggle with God 
and let God know that struggle. The Psalms are a perfect example of that. One third of the Psalms are laments. Psalm 22, which Jesus quoted on the cross, begins with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? From the very words of Jesus on the cross, he quotes that that psalm. Struggle with God openly, but do so in anticipation of God's power. Um, Jesus here, we, we see, if it be possible... Let's put the next verse up there. There we go. Now, back back up one. Back up to this. Okay. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. Now, if it were possible. What Jesus is saying here, if it were possible, the word, the Greek word is dianon, uh, dinaton which is from the Greek word dynamos, from which we get our word dynamite. Are you following me here? There is power in the possibility. There is power in the prayer that Jesus is praying here. Jesus sees the sum total of all the sin of the world and the resulting punishment and penalty that awaits him. And he says, Lord, Give me the power, the possibility for another way to save the world. But he continues, and he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, and yet not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. In the midst of all that Jesus is going through, I love how he addresses God in in verse 36. Abba. The the word in Aramaic means daddy. It's the most intimate word in in that language that you can use for a father. Jesus, and typically it's in terms of pleading and begging. Jesus is pleading and begging with with the Father. He is showing intimacy. And in Romans, Paul tells us in Romans that uh, he says that we receive, uh, Romans 8 15, he says, We receive the Holy Spirit who makes us children of God, and we can cry, Abba, Father. We can have the same intimacy with God if we so choose. If we so choose. Abba, Father. For you, all things are possible. All things are possible. The ultimate goal of prayer is we come to God with our desires, our longings, our preferences, and then we say, yet not what I will, but what you will. And when we pray, Abba, Father, take control of my life and do what you will for your glory, for you know the glory of the future that is beyond our knowledge, we are praying to put our life in God's hands. It is not getting God to do our will, but rather to put ourselves in God's hands that God may do with us His will. It is to become aware of what it is that God wants, what God needs, and how God might use us. It is in the next section that I believe Jesus gets his answer. He has struggled. He has asked God for relief. And now he gets his answer. It begins with the disciples in their failure. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come to the time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. As Jesus struggled, the disciples snoozed. Again. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to say to him. While Jesus is surrendering, 
the disciples are sleeping. They had nothing to say to the Savior because there was nothing to say. No explanation seemed sufficient. They were mute in the face of the majesty of the majesty of Jesus. When Jesus comes a third time to the disciples, even his best disciples could not bear the weight. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Finally, in prayer, we come to a point of submitting to God's will. For the disciples, it's late. They've just celebrated the rich Passover meal with wine. It's no wonder they're sleeping. In Luke 2, 40, 22, 45, he tells us that they sleep because they were filled with sorrow. But the question remains, would his closest disciples be able to withstand the full court press that was coming? And the answer is no. They could not. And with that, Jesus knows that his sacrifice is necessary. He comes three times and they fail him. And Jesus now knows that the cup of suffering is his to bear. Now the sorrow, the anguish, and the questions that Jesus has are gone. The divine Jesus finds strength in surrendering. Jesus went to the garden with questions. And he now emerges strengthened and single-minded. And before he finishes his prayer, we know that the Father sent a heavenly being, an angel, to minister to him. Luke tells us an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. Luke wants us to know that Jesus was never alone. And neither are we. Neither are we. So, what about us? Where are we in our prayer life? Are we ready to truly be open and to, to God and let God know everything that is in our hearts. The good, the bad, the ugly. To lay it all out for God. And, and to pray the prayer, Lord, if it be your will, could it be this way? But to still be willing to pray the prayer, not my will, but yours be done. Expect with confidence God's power to overcome. That's the final step in prayer. To expect with confidence God's power to overcome. For when Jesus got up from this pace of prayer, he had a spirit of resolve and an assurance that he was ready to go to the cross. Jesus was going out to meet his foes, not as a victim, but as a victor. And in the same way, we know that however God answers our prayers, God is with us. We are never alone in our struggles. We are victors. So as you pray, find solitude. Pour out your sorrow. Look for support from others. Struggle with God openly in anticipation of God's power. Submit to God's will. And expect with confidence God's power to overcome. As the band comes, I want to close with a quote from Max Lucado. And I, this quote really makes us think. And as we go through the next few weeks as we're preparing for Good Friday and Easter, let this lay upon your heart and meditate on it. Lucado says this, The battle is won. You may have thought it was won on Golgotha. It wasn't. You may have thought the sign of victory is the empty tomb. It wasn't. The battle was fought in Gethsemane. And the sign of conquest is Jesus at peace in the olive trees. For it was in the garden that he made his decision. 
He would rather go to hell for you than to go to heaven without you. Thanks be to God.